My name is Andres, I'm Roy Hernandez, and I'm about to be associate here at CHP. And I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Benjamin Michael Hill, who is currently a CATP fellow, and he's also a professor uh, of communications at the University of Washington. Uh, he's also an affiliate at the Bergman Center uh, 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 at Harvard, and, uh, and one of the uh, founders of the data, um, the, the, com the Community Data Science Collective, which is a collective of multiple different PIs across universities studying online communities and peer production. Uh, one of the really cool things about Meiko is that he started as an activist and a hacker in the open source community and the free and open source community. He contributed to Debian, the operating system. Uh, but one of the cool things that he's done is that he looks at those communities and doesn't just kind of blindly believe that they're the best and they're, they shouldn't be changed. And instead, he looks at them from a critical perspective as a scholar, trying to help them and understand what are the flaws with these communities, what are the flaws with peer production, and kind of how do we address some of these issues. Uh, peer production is the kind of scholarly term that we, we often use to refer to things like Wikipedia, free and open source software, uh, et cetera, like all these sort of things that we rely for our phones, for OWL is probably running Linux, uh, his computer is running Linux, uh, Wikipedia, you know, is powering OpenAI and other, other things. So uh, really, you know, we, we have um, the pleasure to have Meiko here at CITP for the for the remaining of the semester and really to learn from his perspective, both as a scholar and as a uh, participant in these communities. So with that, Meiko. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Anderson. So we've been friends for a long time. We went to grad school, uh, started grad school in the same yeah, cohort in our orientation together, and it's cool to be reunited here. So, um, all right. Uh, so before I start, I just want to acknowledge that this is um, uh, this is this is work that is uh, collaborative work with a number of people. Um, Aaron Shaw, who's at um, communication studies at uh, Northwestern, probably has like you can see most of his fingerprints on different parts of this. But also, there's lots of work in here that's been done by students within the CDSC. Some of my PhD students the last few years, and I'll try to give call outs to them as I go. So um, let's see. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, so you guys all know Wikipedia and you all know or will not be surprised to hear that it's now well, depending on the on the week, the fifth, somewhere between like the fifth and the tenth most popular website in the world. And you also, I'm sure, all know about its two, well, what to me are its two most charming features mm -hmm. um, uh, because they're highlighted prominently on the front page. Um, first, Wikipedia is free in the sense that it's run by a nonprofit organization who actually had some of their policy staff come here earlier last year. Um, uh, and it's distributed at no cost without advertisements um, under a very permissive license that allows uh, costless consumption and reuse by anyone anywhere. Um, uh, um, in that sense, it's a knowledge commons, and I'm going to be talking more about commons uh, uh, today. Um, but, but second, it's uh, the encyclopedia that anyone can edit. It relies on all of us to build it. So if an article is not good, for example, the article on the Center for Information Technology Policy at Princeton, <laughs> seems to, uh, as of yesterday at least, it's written a little bit like an advertisement, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 someone who came along, um, you can improve it. You can press the edit button, which is prominently on every page, and you will see something like this, which includes information like the fact that the director is Matt Sulganic, which is <laughs> one um, uh, so you could update it. Uh, not only on like a press release, also out of date. So um, uh, I actually did not make this change yet. So anyone uh, uh, actually noticed it when I was reviewing the slides this morning. I was like, oh, shoot, I should have fixed that. Um, anyway, you can fix it. Um, uh, and when you fix it, you're engaging in peer production, which Andres has already briefly introduced. Um, but it's really the it's the term that ties together really almost all the work that I've done um, and that describes um, describes this process. It was a term that was coined by Yochai Benkler, who was one of my mentors and also worked with um, Andres when we were uh, um, as well, um, to describe sort of a, a new mode of production made possible by new communication technologies uh, that have driven the, tr in, in Benkler's telling, the transaction costs associated with uh, sort of contributing knowledge to a knowledge base. Um, so transaction costs means like the costs over and above the act of doing it, um, uh, that those little extra costs are so low that it's made possible for their, a, a new form to a new form of production to emerge. That's Bankler's story. Um, it's, it's distinct from traditional forms in, in, in his telling markets and firms, right? You now people can just through ma this, this mass aggregation of all these small contributions. And Wikipedia is just the pure, it's just the tip of the iceberg. It's actually, I mean, this, this talk will be, I'm talking a lot about Wikipedia, but it's actually almost all of my research is not about Wikipedia. Um, it's about, uh, it's about 
uh, in part because I do sort of organizational level type analyses, so I need lots of them. There's really only one English Wikipedia, but I'll use it as an example. There are actually 300 language versions of Wikipedia, or 300 and some. Um, 15 of them have more than a million articles, and there are thousands of other peer production communities, which are many of which are, many of which are large and successful. Um, uh, the vast majority of which are just millions of peer attempts at peer production for communities, the vast majority of which don't attract even a second or a third person. Um, uh, and there are lots of ones, there, there, there are many thousands that are very successful, including ones that you're very familiar with, including the GNU Linux operating system, which is sort of where I sort of cut my teeth um, in the Debian, uh, the Debian project, um, but also OpenStreetMap, um, Wikia, which was sort of rebranded fandom.com and is a top 50 website, doesn't get the press uh, or attention it deserves, um, and which is all sort of um, peer production wikis, stack exchange, lots of things. Okay. So I'm going to frame the rest of my talk in terms, in terms of two pieces of bad news about peer production and about how I'm sort of like sort of thought about or reconciling these. So this is the first piece of bad news. Um, uh, this is English Wikipedia, the number of active contributors, um, where active in this case is defined as five uh, people who make five uh, contributions a month. But it actually kind of almost doesn't matter how you cut this. You're going to see something very similar, um, uh, like a very similar kind of pattern, which is you see something which looks like super linear growth up until we can actually point to it, March 2007. Um, uh, and then and then uh, sort of some period of sublinear decline. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, people have known about this for a little while. Um, uh, and I think people were pretty shocked um, to see this because that just doesn't, doesn't look like, like the diffusion curves that you see for, for traditional sort of innovations or even for lots of other social media platforms, which tend to look more like that kind of like S-shaped curves, right? Um, you see rapid growth and then transitioning really what appears to be almost sort of instantaneously into, into a period of decline. And so I think that, that um, this is it. This is actually like nothing happened on March 2007. Like nothing obvious happened, right? It's not like that was the day they like turned on some new policy and changed <laughs> something, right? Um, it's actually a little. It's 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 actually a little bit of an empirical puzzle. Okay, more bad news first. It's not just English Wikipedia. Um, these are the top eight versions of Wikipedia, sort of uh, selected in terms of how many articles they have. Again, lots of ways of slicing this. Um, and there's a few things that are worth uh, like that. I that I want to sort of point out uh, right now. I've got lots more of these graphs if you're interested in seeing them uh, um, uh, later. Um, uh, the, uh, the one is that the pattern is actually really quite general, right? So like, I mean, Polish Wikipedia, and you almost might think that that's the same uh, graph. But a couple things. Look at the y-axis here, right? Those are, those are peaking at very different points. So one really common answer as well, I mean, English Wikipedia probably just finished. They wrote all the articles, right? It's an encyclopedia. Not everything gets to be in Wikipedia. Maybe they finished in March 2007. Well, unless you want to make the argument that Polish Wikipedia gets a tiny, there's only a fraction as many things to say in Polish as there is in English, that doesn't seem like that's what's going on. Um, uh, another thing we're pointing out is that you see very regular type things, but they don't seem to happen at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Um, so a number of them do happen around 2007, but Russian Wikipedia peaks much later. Um, so there's an argument which is like, well, I don't know, Facebook was kind of getting bigger around 2007. Maybe this is a Facebook story, right? That didn't seem to be the story either. Um, is there yeah. some seasonality we're seeing too? Just in there the, is seasonality. The there's a lot of seasonality. <laughs> yeah, especially in the smaller ones. Uh, you see a lot of that in the smaller ones. So um, uh, I have lots more of these graphs for like not every Wikipedia, but for lots of them. I think it's very cool. So I spent a lot of time looking at these graphs over the last like I don't know like ten years. Um, uh, so this is a graph from uh, from from Wikia, or Fandom.com. This is the top one percent of wikis as of like two thousand. Uh, they mid they they started acquiring things that got a little bit more complicated. But basically, this is the top one percent of wikis. Um, uh, uh, um, and, and it's standardized in two ways. This is like these are so on, on the x-axis is just like years since they were created. So these are wikis that are created over a relatively long period of time. Um, and then along here, it's sort of uh, standard deviation units. So basically, like within each one has some of them are some of them are really really big. Some of them are uh, many orders of magnitude differences. But what you see is that over a period of about five years, you see a period of kind of growth and decline. Um, uh, it seems to be a regular pattern, and we actually see. And I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to stop myself, but you see very similar patterns around free open source software projects. This seems to be a more general feature of, I mean, I haven't looked at it everywhere, um, but it does seem to be a common feature of large, successful <clears throat> production projects, right? So the vast majority have never attracted second contributor, uh, um, but among the ones that do get big and popular, they tend to transition into periods of like, into periods of decline um, uh, in, a, in a period of about five years, in this case. Okay. Uh, yeah. Your your peak is at March two thousand seven. Mm -hmm. Is it just coincidence that it uh, coincides with the introduction of the iPhone, the first iPhone? I'm, I, uh, oh, I I would say that I mean what, I I I didn't was that March two thousand seven? I didn't know that. So so I think so. 
um, uh, um, because we see sort of similar patterns across like, for example, all these other wikis, which are being founded at lots of different periods of time. Um, I'm arguing that it's a that it's an endogenous process that's not related to iPhones. I mean, I'm sure it's related to it, this is it's complicated stuff. Like, um, I'm sure it's related to everything. Um, uh, um, a lot of people contribute to Wikipedia from their iPhones, which I find crazy. But uh, um, it is actually a major way in which people contribute. Yeah. When you say decline, are you just defining it as uh, decline in edits, or is that just a symptom of something deeper? We'll talk more about. We'll talk more. I think it is a symptom of like an, of a, of a broader process. I think it is something deeper. Um, it is decline in terms of number of edits. Right here, it's a, it's active contributors. It's stuff coming in the door. Stuff coming in the door. People coming in the door. Well, sorry, who are sticking around in active mode? We'll talk about coming in the door in a second. All right. And consumption. Yeah. Consumption. Consumption is going up linearly over this period of time. Um, uh, so uh, consumption, it actually, like, I have, I've made these graphs, which are like the proportion of, if you look at the proportion of like viewers who are editing, that graph looks really bad um, because there's linear growth. So that um, uh, edit number of people viewing has plateaued and actually started declining recently. Although there seems to be some complicated stuff, like the fact that Google has actually incorporated Wikipedia information into like the search engine results. So people are seeing the stuff, they're just seeing it later. So, um, so viewership is going up uh, over this period, basically, until the last few years. Um, okay. All right. So the second, the second piece of the, the second, I'll get to the second piece of bad news, right? So the second piece of bad news is related to the fact that people, the, the reason we're excited about Wikipedia, not just because it produces lots of good stuff and we're excited about that, but also because of the way in which it's doing it. It's doing it by being really open and openness is a big concept. I'm sort of a, um, and I think that, that, uh, Aaron Shaw, my collaborator in a lot of this work has thought a lot about sort of conceptualizing openness. And I think for the purposes of this talk, Think, let's think about openness as the sort of relative absence of formal uh, like formal rules or routines and sort of organizational boundaries. It's easy to just like join Wikipedia, or at least it was easy uh, um, to join a lot of these communities. There were less in the way of sort of rules and sort of like bureaucratic organization in these communities. And it's really exciting that we can build these things without all of that. All right. Second piece of bad news is the peer production projects have become less open in terms of how, how they've grown. And part of this is the answer to that second question. You realize that actually part of the answer is that is that is that these communities are growing less quickly because they're becoming less open. So here's a I'll quickly review a whole bunch of literature, including some that I've done on this space. This is a paper um, uh, led by Brian Butler called "Don't Look Now, But We've Created a Bureaucracy: The Nature of Rules and Policies and Rules in Wikipedia." Wikipedia has a lot of rules. I actually, there's a whole there's like a growing <laughs> Think that, like sort of little community of scholars who are studying rule formation, including some work in political science, um, uh, like by looking at Wikipedia as an example of like sort of the, the creation of rules. And I'm actually a scholar who's doing some of this work as well. So lots of rules, governance uh, uh, activity comes up. This is another book called, the subtitle is Power Concentration and Self-Organizing Bureaucratization and the Evolution of Wikipedia. There's lots of, there's lots of rules and bureaucratic structures within, these, within Wikipedia and within these other communities. They also are becoming, more like 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 more oligarchic in various ways. So the last time I gave a talk at CITP, I was a graduate student and I presented a work that was that was at that point a chapter of my dissertation. Um, it's now uh, um, published with Aaron Shaw called Library Colleagues of Argalgi: How the Iron Lock Sends the Peer Production. That showed that within this within a, again this population of these like wikia wikis, these large communities, that as the communities became more complex, a small group of people present at the beginning tended to consolidate power. They made it harder to join and like access those positions, and their interests actually diverged from those of the rest of the membership. Um, and that this sort of like consolidation of power leads to increased rejection of, new, of, of newcomers. So you can see that over time, uh, that, that participants, people trying to contribute to Wikipedia are much more likely to have their work undone. And, a res as, a res and, and as a result of having their work undone, they say they're much less likely to stick around, right? Um, and we showed that that is true, not just in Wikipedia, but that's true again in this population of these like large um, other wikis and peer production projects. So the story here is not that the faucet is being turned off, right? People are still showing up. The reason that there's the decline, uh, maybe it's slowing down, but the reason it, the reason there's the decline is because the community is rejecting the work of people that are showing up to contribute at, a, at an increasingly high rate. Um, and this is typically seen as a bad thing. Um, uh, at least it was typically seen by me as a bad thing. Um, uh, um, uh, and it's seen as a bad thing because uh, because it was the openness of these communities in terms of governance that attracted me to study it. There was an organization. There was a there was a um, 
political organization, in, uh, like a, a political party founded in Mexico called the Wiki Partido. And it was not because they were like using a wiki to do it. They saw wikis as this like democratize it, like this, this example of this like form of democrat democratic governance that we could we might be able to learn from. Um, but it's also bad because it potentially leads to less vibrant and like productive communities, right? There's lots of potential contributions which are being undone. Um, um, but it's also a major empirical puzzle, right? Why are these organizations becoming more closed in ways that are cutting off the lifeblood that allowed them to succeed and become big in the first place? And so that's the question that I've spent a lot of the last five years trying to answer, in which I'm going to basically be like walking you through my one answer um, to, the, to this question here. And my answer builds on sort of a two major theoretical models that people have used to understand peer production. And so I'm going to introduce those quickly to you. They're going to be familiar to some people already. Um, the first uh, model is uh, treats peer production as a public good. And this is sort of the, um, or it's a sort of collective action problem. And this is the perspective that a lot of the first work that tried to theorize peer production really focused on. Um, it's a public good and it makes a lot of, and it makes a lot of sense for some reasons. The second draws much more from work by Eleanor Ostrom and a number of people that have built on uh, her work around sort of, that, that sort of treats peer production as a commons or as a common full resource. And in particular as a knowledge commons, sort of a new sort of idea. So if you think of, Think peer production, so if you think of peer production, public goods are traditionally sort of defined as having these two features. They're non-excludable in the sense that once you create it, you can't people keep people from having it. And they're non-rivalrous. Sometimes people use the term, uh, like Ostrom calls it, subtractable in the sense that once once one, one person takes it, it doesn't mean that someone else can't take it. And so an example would be something like useful knowledge or national security or the sunset, right? Like, like once you build the knowledge, anyone can, you can't keep someone from, from having it. Uh, once you build national security, everyone gets it. But if someone takes that uh, that um, the that that uh, someone takes it, it doesn't it doesn't, it doesn't take away from it. Um, now, uh, generally speaking, public goods scholars tend to be concerned with provision. How do you build the thing in the first place, right? Because you have free rider problems. Why would this person contribute? They wait for someone else to do it, and you think about selective incentives as a way of incentivizing this. So that's kind of the public goods frame, and this is really, I think, what has dominated the way people thought about peer production for the most part for most of its like most of the last couple of decades. Now, from a public goods perspective, openness is great because it essentially like lowers the transaction costs associated with contributing, right? Like, why would I create barriers to people producing the public good? I might need to incentivize them to participate, um, uh, but I, but I, but, 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 but like, I don't know, creating barriers seems bad. Now, the commons perspective comes from sort of like Eleanor Ostrom, who's sort of like the intellectual boss in the space and is like definitely one of the most inspirational people, like scholars in my life. Um, uh, like she, she's focused on, com on commons or common pool resources, which are defined in terms of, as non-excludable, just like a public good, but they are, but cri the, the critical difference is that they tend to be rivalrous, they're subtractable. So an example of a, of, a, of a common pool resource would be something like a fishery or a forest or, or a library, right? Like now, now if, you're, if, you're, if you're studying like, like a common pool resource, like, uh, like the, the, they're rivalrous in the sense that if you take a fish out of the ocean, that fish is no longer in the ocean, right? And so folks like Ostrom, people in the commons pools resource world have been very focused on questions of appropriation, right? So like, like, cause appropriation means people taking like, you know, like, cause, cause what, what if people take all the fish, right? Now it's a tragedy of the commons kind of thing, right? Um, uh, they're typically not worried about provision, right? You don't typically have to make the fish. Mm -hmm. The fish are kind of making themselves. Um, to some extent, to some extent, right? No, they, no, no, Ostrom does talk about provision in her work, but when she talks about provision, she means provision of the institutions that are going to manage the resource, not the underlying resource, that's, not the creation of the underlying resource itself. Now, from a commons perspective, um, openness is not great. Ostrom's most important book is called Governing the Commons, and like the most important thing in it um, is this list of like, and I, I sometimes describe, it's like the eight principles, so I sometimes describe it, like the eight features of highly effective like commons. Mm -hmm. And number one on the list is clearly defined boundaries, the ability to keep people out. And so when commons people see this, and I'm talking about openness, they're like, why did you think that openness would be good? Um, uh, because in a commons world, like the ability to create spaces around your commons is part of what like seems to be a feature of the kind of thing that causes them to succeed. So how should we think about these contradictory suggestions? Now, my, my suggestion is that understanding the sort of institutional dynamics around openness and closure and these sort of life cycles involves recon reconciling these two perspectives. So here's the graphical summary of what I told you so far, right? This is like communities go up, uh, um, <clears throat> a number of contributors go up, if you're lucky, uh, um, go up and then go down and openness starts and, and, and that among the communities that become successful, they tend to start uh, pretty open and then they become increasingly closed. Um, so my answer to why is Wikipedia declining is something like they're becoming less open, which is causing a, a decrease in the contributor base. But then 
the next question is sort of like the, the question that I, like, sort of, that I want to answer is why. Um, and I think that answering that question involves resolving uh, like uh, is a way to resolve the conflict between those two theoretical perspectives. So what I want to do is what, what I want to suggest is that we need to think not just in terms of growth and decline of contributor bases and openness, but we need to think about an underlying stock of value that, 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 that these communities are in the, in the business of building. Um, so let's and, and that stock of value includes things like digital artifacts, which are pure public goods, but it also includes things like goodwill or reputation or reliability and consistency. It's not just that Wikipedia has a lot of facts, it's that we trust that those facts are mostly right. Right? It's not just that this piece of software exists, it's that that software is one that I'm willing to trust, like my internet to, um, in some sense. And that some of that value is appropriable, um, at least some of it, through participation that benefits certain individuals at the expense of other people, right? So that, so that some of the value that's being produced, the things like the goodwill and the reputation, are commons in some sense. But, that risk of appropriation is very low early on. Like if the goal is just get, getting people in the door, right? We don't have to worry about people trying to like appropriate the stuff that we haven't built yet. But to the extent that we become successful, we gain a second problem, not just building the thing, not just for, the goal one is build the build the thing. Like um, goal two is, oh shoot, we built a thing. <clears throat> now in addition to continuing to build the thing, we'd also like to protect the value of the thing that we've built. All right. But there's one big one big thing that I have an answer, which is what does value appropriation look like in the context of the knowledge commons or a place like Wikipedia? This is the text of the article on mm -hmm. Batman for a brief period of time, uh, <laughs> where the entire text of the article said, no, 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 Batman. <laughs> someone thought this was funny. I, I think it's funny. <laughs> uh, um, uh, someone benefited themselves and perhaps us a little bit uh, um, at the expense of anybody who wanted to know anything about Batman for a brief period of time because they didn't get. I mean, unless you know the song, it doesn't even make sense, <laughs> right? Um, uh, um. <laughs> it's called vandalism and it's extremely common. Um, okay, um, can you uh, play that video? I have a short video that I wanted to uh, play. Um, this is an advertise, this is a video. Let's go back to the beginning, yeah. I mean, just show this. Then, yeah, so this is a short video that was made uh, by like a, like a one and a half minute video or something made by an organization called, go back to the beginning. That's fine. It's made by an organization called, uh, made by uh, an advertising agency with North Face. <laughs> All right, so uh, a few things to point out. Uh, uh, um, uh, they collaborated with Wikipedia. Wikipedia didn't think they were collaborating with that. Uh, um, uh, and uh, it was an entirely one-way collaboration. When they, when they released this video, they were very proud of themselves. Uh, all of their images got deleted. Um, I actually had to have an administrator in Wikipedia undelete one of these images to give to me or like basically copy it out of the archives so that I could use it in this talk. 
Um, uh, um, and if it's not clear, Wikipedia doesn't like this because the trustworthiness of Wikipedia relies on the fact that it's not just an advertisement, which is why the CITP page currently says it's a problem that it sounds like an advertisement or that, that someone at CTP just wrote it. Um, uh, uh, and so, uh, because it's supposed to be a sort of a, like we trust it because we believe that it's not just the homepage of the organization, that it's not just another, another place in which North Face is trying to like put their products in front of us, right? Um, and in some sense, this example is quite neutral because it's actually just advertising. Like, it's just like, it's like, it's just, it's just capitalism. Uh, um, uh, as opposed to like, uh, there are lots of reputation management firms that you can find online who will like take your money to make sure that you or your company, that all the bad stuff about you doesn't show up or stay in the Wikipedia articles. And they have established Wikipedia editors that they try to keep on staff to try to like do this, right? This is a big thing. I have lots and lots of examples of this. Um, uh, and it wasn't a problem that Wikipedia had early on when nobody cared about Wikipedia. Um, uh, uh, the stakes are very, very high. Uh, Croatian Wikipedia, um, this is one of the most extreme examples. A group of Croatian far-right nationalists effectively took complete control over Croatian Wikipedia. They had all the administrator positions, they banned anyone who disagreed with them, and Croatian Wikipedia became a source for like far-right like misinformation, Holocaust revisionism, like lots of bad stuff. And it took about 10 years for the Wikimedia Foundation to like fix this problem. Um, um, I'm going to come back uh, and talk more about this because I just actually a couple weeks ago put a paper online about this uh, case. Um, uh, uh, but I want to suggest that it's not just, these are all like kind of bad based examples, like, like information operation kind of stuff uh, or advertising campaigns. Um, it can also come from good faith contributors. This is the article on the Harlem Shake, which is a dance, and the entire text is <laughs> edited to say, oh, oh God, I didn't mean to read it all, just one paragraph, please help, right? Sometimes people that are trying to help are just not very good at helping yet, um, and that their learning process happens at the expense of anyone who wants to know any, literally anything about Harlem Shake other than someone who doesn't know how to edit Wikipedia just tried to edit it, okay. One final example. So people know who Jeremy Renner is. Mm -hmm. um, well, you could read the Wikipedia article if you don't. He's an American actor, <laughs> singer, songwriter, with a loss of <laughs> uh, um, uh, And the reason I'm showing this is because uh, it makes another point, which is, well, for one, this wasn't a one-off thing, actually. The Jeremy Renner article <laughs> has, the last like 10 years been repeatedly edited um, uh, to suggest that he is a velociraptor in ways that are incredibly creative and kind of funny. Um, but the reason I'm showing it is not because of that, but because of what happened as a result of this, which is that the article by user top banana uh, <laughs> became protected. And protected means uh, it was blocked so that users who were new and unregistered could not edit it, unlike many other pages on Wikipedia. And so in response to vandalism, this page became, um, it was changed so that anybody who is not already an established Wikipedia editor can't contribute to it. It's just not allowed. All right. Uh, I, want to, I want to walk you through a model of peer production. So this is actually, a, um, there's a formal mathematical model that Nisha, where are you? Yeah, we've been working on uh, for the last few, uh, um, uh, for the last few months and are continuing to meet weekly about. And I'm going to spare you the math here, although I really want to talk about the math. So if you'd like to talk about it, uh, let's talk about the, let's talk about the little dynamical systems model. Um, I'm going to walk you through a sort of conceptual sense of what the model is doing. So. Um, Basically, the suggestion, what I'm suggesting is that we should think of every knowledge commons as having a, some, as two things. They have two features. They have a stock of value and some amount of openness. Um, and then every day, they get, they get in the mail a package. And that package contains one of the, uh, two things. Some amount of good stuff, good contributions. Those are contributions that are going to go and increase the stock of value. And some amount of bad stuff, right? That's damage. And that's vandalism. That's all those other kinds of things. And those are going to decrease the stock. North Face, you know, big, big bad stuff, North Face that shows up, right? Um, and then every day, based on what comes in or based on whatever state they're in, uh, they can make some change, it's a decision to change their openness based on that damage. And we're sort of exploring a couple different kind of policy type, sort of like policy within the community type approaches. One, that we're, but, but I think that uh, one we're actually showing is actually one in which they're actually, they're, they're optimizing for this. They're choosing, they're choosing pieces that it optimizes the, 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 the stock and uh, the, the, the stock. So, um, uh, uh, Critically in this model, both contributions and damage are positive functions of both openness and of, of, uh, of stock. So there's a virtuous cycle. The more, the more stuff you have, the more good stuff's gonna come in, right? Good news. But the more good stuff you have, the more bad stuff's gonna come in as well, right? Being open is good, you get more good stuff, but you also get more bad stuff, right? And so you can think of this as being like a, you've got like a, you've got some sort of like, openness is like a filter. 
you know, and it's going to, you know, you can block the bad stuff, but there's going to be a little bit of collateral damage. So just to walk through a really, really simple example, this is a toy example. These numbers aren't, aren't real. Let's, you start out, uh, you have no stock, but you're very, very open. So lucky you, maybe you'll get some contributions. Because you've got some contributions and you're really open, the next time you're going to get more contributions. That's great, even more than you got the first time, right? But you're going to get some bad stuff as well. And so depending on your threshold, uh, your feelings about how, how much you don't like that bad stuff, what you can do is you can you can turn down that, that you can close a little bit, right? To try to protect the value of the stuff that you've already built. And in order to do that, um, uh, and you do that, and then you'll get you'll get a smaller amount of good stuff, but maybe some bad stuff is uh, maybe maybe less definitely less bad stuff as well. So if you walk through the model, we see those dynamics. Um, uh, we see the dynamics that that I'd sort of discussed. That uh, openness leads to if you start out really open, uh, you, you get more contributions, and those contributions increase your stock. But because your stock is bigger, you also start getting some bad stuff, and then because you get the bad stuff, you become increasingly closed, and eventually the end state is that it all goes into amber, basically. Um, the community becomes closed, but don't worry, uh, we've built the 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 uh, we built we we built the thing. Okay, what about random chance? I'm so glad I asked. Um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, randomness leads to a couple of really cool things. One is is it leads to uh, like it leads to these this uh, to inequality in participation uh, like uh, across across. So you end up with this like you end up with massive inequality. Like you some really really big ones and some really really small ones. Part of that's that there's these like sort of the, there's this to the feedback loop which is in it right. So uh, because you have this this virtual cycle about dynamics. Also, um, if you, it, you can, it's very easy to get to a situation where where basically the optimal strategy is to start really open. If you don't start really open, you'll never you'll never build a stock. But uh, um, uh, your chance of building a stock is much lower, right? Um, but uh, but 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 the optimal strategy has to become to begin uh, begin open and become closed, sort of put it in amber moving forward. These are just two distributions of um, of uh, sort of uh, people across projects um, uh, in two different so uh, free and open source software setting and in Wikia. Um, both these sort of like, see these power law distributions. I don't like believe in like social laws, but if I were going to believe one, it would be something about like inequality and participation across uh, these sorts of projects. Just to yeah. clarify, what do you mean by randomness there? Oh, I just mean that like like that uh, that, that if it's not so right now th this model that I showed you here this is entirely deterministic, right? Like so, I just mean that like you have some some sort of like chance, like there's some sort of like a, a little bit of random chance in terms of like whether or not you're going to get like a, a, a certain amount of contribution. In this step of the model, or you're saying there's a bunch of different platforms and people are randomly choosing. Oh, so I, I have another paper where I actually am doing individual choice between th uh, between okay. things, but no, not in this case. In this case, there there's no there's no interaction between uh, there's no choice here. There's no okay. interaction between them. They're all just individual, yeah, um, in this model. I'd be very interested in, like, it, it would actually bring together, I have a different nature-based model, which is about, like, community choice, um, uh, which is, uh, but I'd be interested in talking more about that. Yeah. yeah. I keep thinking about March 2007. Yeah. I was wondering if there is anything in the model that can predict uh, the kind of phase change that you showed mm -hmm. in the absence of a major policy change. It mm -hmm. seemed like even when openness was being slightly changed, perhaps it switched from a virtuous to a- Yeah, I think that the answer, I think that that is true. We haven't looked at that, but that's a good, that's a good suggestion, yeah. I think so. I think the answer should be yes. Yes, we should be able to determine when that period is going to be. And that actually gives you some like a lot of like, it, like like from a policy perspective, you're like, oh, cool. Like maybe this is a time that we want to like start slowing things down or whatever. Yeah. So does your model predicts continuous decline in contributions? Yes. But when I look up your like initial figure for English language Wikipedia, yeah, kind of the number like of edits are kind of look stable over the last. Yeah, period. it's going down. It's true, and it actually has become destabilized. Yeah, that's true. Um, how would you your model explain the? I think my model wouldn't explain that yet. That's a good okay. point. Yeah. yeah, I'm curious. I don't have I don't have an answer for that. Um, yeah, I got two questions just about the model without you going into the math. Uh -huh. The first is if like the positive contributions in the model do something to the amount of damage, like. It, it just is contribution. No, there's just like one. It's just like it's just or... it's like it's it's stock increasing, stock increasing. Okay, yeah. got it. And then the second one is how's openness operationalized? Ooh, um, uh, so openness is operational. So you can think of it as like a like thinking of it as like a like a like a filter, okay. like or like a like a classifier, right? Like basically things are coming in. There's some you can actually think you can actually describe it in terms of like things that you would describe to say a filter, like sensitivity and specificity, or like precision and recall, right? Like okay. there's some amount of there's some. I'm, it's a, I'm trying to detect the good things that are coming in. Um, uh, but 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 you can't make a perfect filter. There's going to be some amount of like kind of like coll coll collateral damage. So that's how it's sort of that's how it's sort of conceived of and how it's operationalized in the model. Yeah, yeah. So these steps in getting 
less open, do you see different trajectories there? So I can imagine that open is like sort of a, you're there and the moment you start sort of yes. undermining it, it changes, but are there different pathways? You can... There are different pathways empirically and I'll, I'll show one and I'd love to talk about it. Yeah. I was yeah. just thinking about this question of like why, why it doesn't seem to just keep going down. Yeah. And it seems to me like within any particular community, there might be a perceived sense of like the amount of trouble that input is worth. And at some point, as they close off, they reach an equilibrium where they're like, we're still getting some bad stuff, but that bad stuff is it, we perceive it or, or however, you know, however these kind of decisions about openness are made. It seems like it's, it's worth the trouble to yeah. fix these errors in Wikipedia and, you know, change these things in order to still have good stuff come mm -hmm. in. So, yeah. I can think. I, 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 I'm thinking about this question. I want to. I should maybe talk actually. But I, I have. I have more things to say about that. And I have some answers. I think from the from the particular context of why I think it's not gone. And part of the answer is is that like I joined Wikipedia in 2005. Like 2005 and 2006 were just like an unbelievable vintage for Wikipedians. Like the proportion <laughs> of those people that are actually just still around is extremely high. And I think that's not a thing that the model really captures. Um, uh, it treats the contributions as being kind of like independent in that way. You don't have the. I don't. Have, I don't have people. In it. There's no people in this model. Um, uh, and I think that that's a potential limitation. So obviously it would become much more complex if I did that. So, um, okay, I'm gonna move forward and talk a little bit about some empirical examples and then we'll have hopefully a few minutes at the end to talk. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna talk about three things actually. Uh, first is damage, um, three is sort of empirical evidence in support of this. So there's a lot of ways, it's a complex, it's, it, it's a model, I mean, it's a simple model in some sense, but there's a lot of ways in which you, there's a lot of things that it sort of predicts. Um, one is, is that it suggests that damage should increase when value increases. Another thing it suggests is that um, communities should become less open in the face of damage. And a third thing it suggests is that openness should reduce, and this is getting at the question of how do you conceive of openness, that it should reduce both the good stuff and the bad stuff. I'm gonna show you some empirical results from each of these sort of things. I'm primarily, and despite presenting like a, a model here. I'm actually basically an empiricist. So uh, this is the this is most of what I spent my time doing. Um, okay. Does damage increase uh, with community value? So I already talked to you about the Croatian case. Um, uh, um, I want to tell you a little bit about this uh, paper, which is just up on the archive as of a couple weeks ago, um, uh, which is led by Zareen Karazian, who's a student at the University of Washington, which is sort of documenting this process um, in, in, in detail. Now, the question for us was not like what happened with Croatian Wikipedia. That's actually pretty well documented. This is a report published by the Wikimedia Foundation. Our question was like, why didn't it happen? Why, doesn't, why didn't it happen everywhere else? And in particular, why didn't it happen in the three other uh, Croatian, like Serbo-Croatian language Wikipedias? Um, uh, some of which are very similar. And so what we did was we interviewed, um, this is an interview-based study, um, we, I mean, uh, Zareen interviewed a ton of people that were actively involved, both with sort of broader sort of Wikipedia level, kind of like um, uh, sort of meta-adminship in some sense or monitoring, and then a bunch of people that were involved in these particular communities as well. And she came up with three answers. And I'm gonna tell you the first one first, because it speaks to this point which was the first answer was something really only pertained to, to two of the four, the server Croatian uh, Wikipedia, which is in, which was the first, um, uh, the, and, and is in a, the, I mean, all server Croatian, uh, the language, uh, and many people have different names for it, uh, Serbian, Bosnian, and Croatian are sort of, they're, they're, it's all, they're all versions of Serbo Croatian, they're national variants of a single language. There was, they created one, one Wikipedia first, and then they sort of split off and created a set of national variants. The Serbo Croatian Wikipedia continues to be around, but um, the short version is, is that the, the people we talked to uh, said, why didn't, you know, like Serbo Croatian or Bosnian get captured? They were all just like, oh, well, it's just like not very valuable. And it's not very valuable for two reasons. One is, is that they're small. They're much smaller than the other than than the other two, and part of that has to do with sort of like the natural size of the language community. But another reason is is that Serbo Croatian didn't correspond to a national identity. People, I mean, like maybe if you're like a kind of retro Yugoslav, you're like you know like uh, <laughs> people said that. That's like almost like not a direct quote, but like they said like yeah, it's kind of like and it's like a little like you know like a like anachronistic in some sense. But I think that like it didn't correspond to a national identity, so it was just not valuable as a source for um, as a source for capture. So that was like sort of one answer they gave. Um, basically, damage, the worst kind of damage in this case, is only an issue when people care. And if people don't care that much, um, uh, it's not seen as a platform, a way to reach lots of people, or it doesn't correspond to an identity, they might, they're less likely to, you know, to, to try to capture it. This is an estimate of the number of dam damaging edits per day. And this was done by taking a random sample of all edits uh, made to Wikipedia and then using this, um, there's a machine learning classifier that the Wikimedia Foundation has created and which uh, uh, I've used in a bunch of research, which sort of estimates whether or not uh, things are damaging. It's used in a lot of vandal fighting uh, work by hi highlighting things to like, <laughs> yeah, the Batman edit, like you might want to take a look at this one. Um, uh, and what you see 
is a massive increase in the number of damaging uh, edits or sort of like what the, the classifier sort of thinks are damaging edits around 2007. Um, uh, like tens of thousands, like, 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 like many thousands a day from basically nothing very quickly. Is this in English? Or what? Is this English. This is English. This is just English. Um, uh, um, but of course, there's also increase in the total volume of stuff going on here and potentially people that are coming in that can do vandal fighting work. Yeah. Do you know what that just huge outlier point right before your March 2007 line is? Like uh, just like over 20,000 yeah. damaging edits? Uh, I, I, I don't think it corresponds. There wasn't like was a, there like a campaign, campaign or something. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. That's, that's not, 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 that, not that I know. Right. This isn't, this is a hand coded sample. Uh, so, 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 but this is getting at the proportion of uh, of, of damaging edits. And so, this is a much, this is a much better data. This isn't using the classifier. This is using a hand coded sample of edits um, uh, um, uh, for damaging. And what you see is it go. And what you see is actually like in some ways even more stark. You see an increase from like five percent of uh, like five to ten percent of edits um, are sort of estimated to be uh, like in this case are estimated to be damaging to something like a third of all contributions. That corresponds to a massive increase in the amount of stuff going in, right? So it's not just a big, it's, a, it's, it's, there's a huge in, influx in the amount of vandalism that happens around this period in which Wikipedia became increasingly closed, um, uh, started rejecting lots of work. Um, uh, um, and that, that the, the, yeah, the increase there too. Okay. All right. Second question. Do these comments become less open as they grow? I've already suggested in the beginning that the answer to this is yes, so I won't spend too much time on it. This is from that paper that um, that, that I mentioned, the Laboratories of Oligarchy paper. This just shows the proportion that uh, one of these large communities is going to add a new administrator as the community increases in size. And what you see is it goes from being very small to being like basically zero um, uh, by the time you have 200 people in the door. These are model predicted probabilities. And then this is, uh, uh, this is a measure which captures uh, the number of times administrators are going to be undoing the work of uh, people, of other editors, with a history of making good contributions to the community, right? So it's not just vandal, it's not anti-vandalism work. This is actually like undoing the work of like like people that appear to be contributing have a history of, of contributing successfully, and you see that that increases substantially as well. This is a measure from English Wikipedia of the number of so these this was not English this was many different communities. This is a measure from English Wikipedia of the number of articles which are being protected, like the Jeremy Renner article, right? Locked down so that other people can't contribute to it. Um, and you can see that it, I don't put the, I'm sorry for not putting my line in 2007 in there, but 2007 is right about here. Um, you see that this is 2005, 2010, you see a big increase right around that period of time. And I think that um, one thing to keep in mind with this is that although this one does go down, protection events very often last like for a long period of time or maybe even forever. Right, so these are these these are sort of accreting, right? The community is becoming increasingly locked down. Like, go to the front page of Wikipedia. There's no edit button. It says view source because that page is protected, right? And actually, most of the most widely viewed articles are protected. It's become much more difficult to contribute. Okay. Um, do decreases in openness? A third question. Do decreases in openness um, uh, result in uh, reductions in contributions and damage? The answer to this seems to be, at least in some cases, yes as well. This is from a paper uh, called "The Hidden Costs of Requiring Accounts." This is a paper also with Aaron Shaw, where we looked at uh, 130 some uh, wikis uh, from again from Wikia or Fandom that all instituted a requirement that for, for to, they started requiring accounts in most cases because they were trying to reduce vandalism. Um, and the thought reasoning here. Is, is that most vandalism comes from people without accounts. So let's make a barrier to contribution uh, and that'll make it a little bit harder to contribute and that might reduce vandalism. And it works. There was like, depending on how you measure it, like, a, like a, up to a 70% decrease in the, amount of, uh, in the amount of vandalism that are happening in these communities. But the collateral damage was huge. Our estimates were that it corresponded to, a, depending on how you measure it, between a 20 and a 40% decrease in the amount of good stuff coming in the door. And because there's so much more good stuff than bad stuff, it meant that for every Bad edit, bad edit you deterred, you would deter between six and seven um, uh, potential good ones as well. Okay. So um, when I started thinking about this problem four to five years ago, I basically thought like closure is bad, like how do we stop it? And I wanna speak to this and to the broader question of what we should do here with sort of two final examples um, that are more recent examples from some of my uh, my research. Um, and the the, so anyway, the, the, the first piece is an example to the, is, is a response to the simplest answer to this sort of like question or dilemma, which is kind of like, I don't know, this is like the, all these administrators are consolidating power in ways that are cutting off the lifeblood of these communities. If we just fired all the administrators, people could contribute and communities would be able to grow. Well, 
Someone did it. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so I don't know if anyone knows Wiki Travel. Wiki Travel is a um, well, they sort of did it. Um, Wiki Travel was a travel guide. You think like Lonely Planet, right? And it's not a Wikimedia Wikimedia project. It's existed for a long time. Uh, Wiki Travel uh, had a bunch of articles and was acquired in 2013 by a company called Internet Brands. And I will sort of uh, Internet Brands is I'll put it sort of impolitely, my personal opinion. Uh, um, they are a company that basically strip mines online communities. Um, they buy very popular online communities, and there's a bunch of ones, including some that you probably know and use. Um, uh, and then they run as many ads as possible on them. Um, and at least in the position that people in Wiki Travel do as little as possible to basically maintain the technological and social infrastructure of those communities. Um, they uh, so so the people in Wiki Travel were not very happy about this marriage. Well, anyway, I mean, they never signed up for it, but uh, the active editors. And so they eventually basically became upset enough about it that they went and took the whole database, which was released freely in the way that Wikipedia is. And they went to the Wikimedia Foundation and created a new project called Wiki Voyage with the same database, all the same articles, right? But something kind of funny happened. So this is this is work that's being led by a student of mine, uh, Ellie Mercedes Ross, um, and it's sort of it's ongoing, but this is some like sort of early results. She thinks about this in terms of like core and periphery. You have all these administrators, and you have all these other peripheral positions. You sort of end up in a situation where the whole core left, like all the administrators in Wiki Travel went to Wiki Voyage, but like all the people that are coming there from Google, they didn't get the memo, <laughs> right? So they kept contributing, and sure enough, you saw exactly this, right? If you look at the number of, she's measuring core, I think this one is in terms of, there's a few different ways of doing it. This I believe is in terms of like people that are making like, I forget, like more than hundred edits or something like that, like very active contributors. And you can see that there are way more of them in Wiki Voyage than in Wiki Travel. Um, and this is over the period of the, the, the split was around 2013. But the periphery situation looks exactly like the opposite, right? There were way more random people coming and making an edit or two um, in wiki in wiki travel than in wiki voyage, right? Um, so what happened? Um, the top graph is the number of new characters which are being added to that to articles in the first year, and these are the two distributions. And you can see wiki travel the the, the dark one here. This is wiki voyage. This is the one with the 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 with the core but no periphery. You can see that basically the people that, that that when they left the the community that had the periphery had more stuff coming in the door. They had more contributions. They had more text. The articles were larger. But if you look at a measure of quality, and so in this case, we're using a measure called listing. So basically this is like, it's not just like how much text is it, but is it like structured in a way that it has like the, the like, do they have like phone numbers for like the hotels, they have opening hours for the restaurants, that kind of stuff. There was way more of that uh, um, uh, happening or increasing in the, the community with the, with the core, but without the periphery, right? You kind of need both. That, that you need the good stuff coming in, but the, but the core were providing actually a lot of the quality in that community. And so I think that like, we flip back to the graphs here, it actually doesn't look particularly great for either is kind of like the takeaway, um, I think. If anything, the peripheral members in Wiki Voyage are going up, but it's slow. Um, uh, and in terms of views, uh, Wiki Voyage passed Wiki Travel very recently after like close to a decade, maybe it was like seven or eight years. Um, uh, which is to say that maximizing openness doesn't maybe seem like it's like the Wiki Travel model of just like fire all the advents. That doesn't seem like it's really the answer either. I want to come back to this example of Serbian and Croatian Wikipedia. To the other two, I so I showed you the first result, but there were actually three um, uh, in in Zarin's piece. The bigger puzzle actually was like, okay, great. I've explained Serbian and Bosnian were just not they were not like attractive targets. They weren't seen as valuable. But what about Serbian? Serbian is actually even a little bit bigger. A few a few more speakers, and it's not like there aren't Serbian nationalists. There are plenty. And actually, what we learned in the in the what we learned in our interviews were that that um, they were actually both quite open initially. And that actually Serbian was at some risk, real risk of capture. Um, uh, the differentiator was not closure per se, but with the specific way in which closure happened. Serbian was more, more, was actually more open when it came to when it came to governance, but less open when it came to um, when it came to formalization of rules. Right. So Serbian for Wikipedia, for example, like the Croatian Wikipedia never had a rule about like when to block a person. And so people blocked whenever they wanted, right? Serbian, that bureaucratization actually kept the community from being captured in other ways, right? So I guess that what I want to suggest is that like both were open in some ways and both were closed in some ways, but the specific ways in which they were open and closed, and this is getting at that question earlier, right? That mattered a lot um, in terms of the in, in terms of the outcome here, which ended up, I mean, it translated into lots of people getting banned in the Croatian model as well, and lots of people not wanting to contribute because it was considered. The Ministry of Education, Ministry of Education, who I believe was like kind of a right wing 
person was like, yeah, don't look at that website. It's too much um, for Croatian during the period in which it was really bad. Okay. So I just have a couple uh, takeaways. I want to sort of say that I that that um uh by like that that I've sort of moved from this closure is bad to this model where I think of like how do we manage openness to effectively sustain knowledge commons. Um, and what I want to suggest is that like by suggesting that 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 closure is potentially like a rational strategy, right? And I'm hoping to change the conversation around openness and closure in the context in, uh, in knowledge commons in general. Now, um, the stuff that I presented in bad, uh, bad news at the beginning, part of my big argument here is that maybe we should stop thinking about it as bad or as like, maybe maybe be thinking about it in terms of bad and good isn't quite as like, like the right way of framing it. Um, uh, it maybe it's bad in some ways, but it's the best we can do in some sense. That we actually are we have multiple goals and we're trying to optimize for multiple things, and we have to think about it as that. Um, and then when we do that, we end up in a situation where unfortunately we have all the problems of everyone who thinks about like complex governance problems and policy problems. Um, but the good news is, is that we can learn from all of the people that have studied in those spaces as well. Closure and decline, you know, are like I want to argue, like uh, like th they mean navigating a real set of trade-offs, um, solving a real set of problems. We could probably do better than what we've done or than what Wikipedia has done. Um, but I think that 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 we're gonna have to make compromises. Um, um, and I'm hoping that through that process, we can sort of, by thinking of closures and in adaptive institutional response, we can build maps of mobilization or governance trade-offs, um, like the one that I've shown in Croatian, um, um, and how they shift over the life cycles of communities. So this is getting at the question of like, yeah, well, maybe we want different policies at different points, right? Or maybe we can use a model to understand that at this point, we might want to approach things in this way. And so that's sort of what I'm hoping to build out of this broader project. Um, yeah, what should we do? Um, uh, embrace the fact that, our go that we have goals that are intention, think about challenges um, and how they change over time, and then maybe begin to think about openness less as like a, a good that we want and more of a filter that we can improve the performance of, right? Um, uh, reduce the cost of the bad thing relative to the good thing. So that's what I've got. Uh, there's a couple minutes uh, for questions. Thank you all. Yeah. So does this mean that Wikipedia should not be free? I mean, if you post it like a toe on, on, on the road. I mean, it's still a good brand, uh, but I think that, I mean, Wikipedia has never been free uh, in some sense, right? Like, I think that Wikipedia should not be, we should not think of openness as like, uh, like, I mean, like it's, it's, it's not like a religious, like, thing that we should be committed to. We should approach it as like a governance challenge, right? How should we design forms of openness that, that maximize the good stuff while 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 minimizing the costs and preserving the quality of the stuff we produce. Yeah. Um, in your list of knowledge commons, I saw your list is Reddit. Yeah. And so the governance model in Reddit is actually different compared yeah. to Wikipedia, right? So you have subreddits, you have mods. I was wondering if you had any insights to share about uh, uh, contributions, or like what the trends are on Reddit compared to yeah. Yeah, so um, I've uh, so so Reddit is interesting as a peer production project. It's like, what it is, what is it that's being peer produced? There's a lot of like just talk on that community, um, but I think that if nothing else, there's peer production of like the collaborative filtering aspect. They're, we're producing a sense of what the most important thing to read is on a particular niche topic at a particular point. Um, I, I mean, I know that's a, that's a I have like two or three papers that I published on governance in Reddit, and like a couple more things that are in progress, and it's a like. It's it's uh, I think it's actually really interesting because of the sort of the it's very similar from as a governance structure to Wikipedia. Um, we've done some work where we have collected a data set of uh, longitudinal data set of rules in Reddit um, before they sort of cut down the API. So we have several years of that change. One answer is is that I can tell you they have rules and the number of rules never goes down. Uh, um, uh, and that's and that's a that's a result from Reddit as well. Uh, okay, there's. Three, uh, no. I was just yeah. a quick follow up to that. Yeah. Uh, more generally, peer production is a big category that yeah. includes a lot of things. You lump them together, which is useful in some ways. But I'm wondering if you think this story you're telling is across all these kinds of things or how it's different within that big yeah. lumping. Yeah, I mean, I think that that. I believe that this story will be true in any situation where you have these two dynamics, where you have some sort of stock of value which is being built and built, and where some aspect of that stock is sort of like going to be like appropriable by other people. I think that that's a feature of. I think that the particular mix of like the nature of the goods that are being produced in different peer production projects are different. Like there may be some that are producing pure, pure public goods, in which case I would expect it to be a pure uh, collective action problem. 
Um, so I think that like, um, I also think that there are things that are not peer production projects that probably share these features as well and that I would expect to um, work in similar ways. So I think that you're right. I did kind of lump them together. And I think it's probably not the, I mean, I talk about peer production a lot because that's like what I think and like, do research about like yeah. all the time. But I think that there's probably a more careful way of articulating what the theoretical object is. And I'd be happy to talk more about what um, what that could be. I'm so very it's one thirty people um, when I leave, it's fine. And uh, let's thank Michael one last time and stay for the two. And I'm also here. Uh, <laughs> <That's all laughs> all here. <laughs> My office is right there. So I think that um uh, I I you know I'm normally very far away from here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I really, if you want to talk, uh, I would really love to like grab coffee or lunch or something like that with really anyone here. So thank you. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, I